As Mikola sets off on the first special stage high up the mountain, the low cloud and fog severely restrict visibility. Behind Mikola is Jimmy McRae in his Opel Manta 400, followed by Per Eklund in the Group A Toyota Corolla. Eklund, known to excel in these conditions, is chasing the manufacturer's title for Toyota. Henry Teubelin's back injury means he is replaced in the Rothmans Porsche team by the young Finn, Juha Kankunen. Three times winner of the Manx, Tony Pond this year is driving a Group A Rover Vitesse. He knows the island well, but in these conditions, it's the co-driver who becomes the eyes inside the car. Pond can see little ahead of him, so he relies on co-driver Rob Arthur to read the pace notes that they've made together in days of practicing before the event. In these conditions, the pace notes are the only way to a fast time. Driver and co-driver must have absolute faith in each other's ability. When the visibility improves, Pond's natural skill is clear for all the many spectators to see. The Rover Vitesse is a big, big car, and the Isle of Man roads are narrow and twisty. But right from the start, it's Russell Brooks in his Opel Manta 400 who is really flying. Eklund, in the same class as the big rover, has electrical problems in the Toyota Corolla GT, and it's down on power. Kankunen's rally is soon to be over. Before he's actually been able to exploit the enormous power of the Rothmans Porsche, a sudden drop in oil pressure leads to an expensive engine failure on only the fourth special stage. And there's high drama, too, for championship leader Mikola. The incessant bumps on the Manx roads have led to the Audi Quattro being stuck in fourth gear, making it impossible to drive up the mountain. So, that was the end of Manx 84, I'm afraid. Very short one for you. Short one, yes. Three stages only. Also suffering from the bumps, physically, is Chris Lord in the VW Golf. It leads to a back injury for the Yorkshireman, while Lancashire man Cyril Bolton is having the drive of his life in an unbelievable third place. Bertie Fisher's problems are not with the driver, but with his car. The Opel Manta 400 is severely restricted by brake problems. Ian Tilk is taking full advantage of the early retirements and pushes his Silkeline Escort hard, establishing himself with the front runners. Local driver Tony Higgins should know where he's going. His wife Christina is co-driving. With Mikola out, it's obvious we're going to have a British Open champion. But will it be Russell Brooks or Jimmy McRae in the AC Delco car? For either driver, outright victory is far from certain by the way Pond is handling the Rover. But Bertie Fisher is finding the brakeless Opel a handful. In Group A, Michael Sundstrom's Opel Ascona is setting a fast pace, while Chris Lord is set to retire, and at the end of the first day, a puncture has cost Russell Brooks over three minutes. So it's Jimmy McRae who leads, but he too has had his moments. McRae starts the second day with a two and a half minute lead over Brooks. Russell is determined to close the gap and is driving absolutely flat out. Chasing them both is a hard charging Tony Pond. While catching Pond is Bertie Fisher in his Shell Gold car. The weather still hasn't improved. The roads are wet and very slippery. Ian Tilk presses on in the escort. He's in ninth place. For Toyota, the new day looks brighter. The Audi Quattro's retirement means the manufacturer's crown is safe. But Eklund wants to be back in the top ten. Yesterday's problems have pushed him well down the field. As Brooks and McRae battle for the lead, the higher retirement rate sees new names running at the top of the field. Theo Bengri in his Opel Ascona, hot rod racer Davy Evans in the Nissan 240RS, and Mark Lovell is showing well in the Coupe VW Golf GTI. But McRae's lead is cut when he too has a puncture and loses nearly a minute. Now the race is really on. Brooks sees his opportunity and presses the Scotsman even harder. 
setting fastest times over the next two stages, slicing more time away from McRae, but it's not to be. On stage 31, Russell's Manta hits a bridge parapet and he's out of the rally, a sad end to his hopes of being British champion. Brooks' demise pushes Pond up to second place. But Bertie Fisher is now going much quicker. His brakes at last seem to have been sorted out, and he overtakes Pond, but is still a long way behind McRae. The 1984 Rothmans Max Rally now has a settled look to it, with McRae first and the others left to fight amongst themselves for the minor placings. Fisher is in a comfortable second place as dusk falls at the end of the second day. As Jimmy McRae sets out on the final morning, again there's fog. The Scotsman's lead is impressive, but he cannot afford to relax or let up the incessant pace over the narrow roads. If he does, it could lead to a lapse in concentration and McRae would hand victory to a hard-charging Bertie Fisher. Pong too is ready to capitalize on any mistakes made by the two Opal drivers. Davy Evans is a good sixth, another impressive performance. Per Eklund has moved up to seventh place, a remarkable drive by the hard-working Swede and the neatly turned out Toyota Corolla GT. John Price has kept his Renault 5 turbo pointing in the correct direction, despite the car being difficult to handle in the wet conditions. Then, last-minute drama. Almost at the end of the rally, Tony Pond's excellent third place suddenly looks in jeopardy as the Rover Vitesse struggles into the St. John's service area in obvious trouble. The torque tube's broken. That's something that uh, supports the rear axle. The car doesn't like that stage up there. It's the second time we stopped in there. You actually stopped, did you? Well, we crawled out. The mechanics crawl in under the rear of the rover to try and repair the damage, but there's precious little service time available. Luckily, it kept going. How much time has it cost you? Uh, about a minute. Not much. As long as they can fix it, that's the problem. Do you think they will be able to? Uh, it depends how much damage it's done while it's run for the seven or eight miles, all flying around under there. But the Austin Rover team work wonders and complete the repairs just in time. Pond responds to this and sets five fastest times in the final six stages to retain his third place. 100. McRae is on his way to a famous victory. Bertie Fisher is second. Sunshine towards the end of the event pleases all the drivers. For Pierre Eklund, his seventh place means he wins the Group A driver's title. So McRae cruises to a well-earned first place by a massive 11-minute margin over Bertie Fisher. No longer with brake problems, the Irish Opal driver finishes the Manx Rally in his familiar style. Third place for Pond emphasizes the potential of the Rover Vitesse as a rally car. It has totally dominated the Group A class, much to the pleasure of Tony many fans on the island. Local man Ian Corkill finishes in fourth place, and this despite one huge moment when his car left the road and leapt a hedge at over 100 miles an hour. Fifth is Theo Bengri and his Opel Ascona. And sixth, the Nissan 240RS of Davy Evans. A good year for Toyota GB ends with their second successive manufacturer's title, thanks to Per Eklund and co-driver Dave Wittick, who's on his honeymoon. I suppose that's one way to spend it. As the AC Delco Opel Manta 400 drives up the finish ramp on Douglas Seafront, this brilliant win confirms Jimmy McRae as 1984 British Open Rally Champion. It's his second win in three years and his third championship title. No wonder he and co-driver Mike Nicholson look so delighted.